Okay. So this is me. So I've been working in this field for probably 20 years now. And I helped uh, do a lot of things about risk assessment and security before it was an issue, like before 9-11 for that's one big, uh, big interesting thing that happened. And so I'm certified in Homeland Security, anti-terrorism, uh, CMS all hazard risk assessment, active shooter, and all these other things. So I originally started out in IT, and then I moved to doing facility security because it was more interesting to me, more interesting different things going on. So you can uh, check my, what I've done. The other thing I've done is taken this and moved it to different areas as things happen. So after 9-11, I sat down with an, well, Admiral Pl Paul Pluta, and we wrote the Coast, we wrote the, the Coast Guard Risk and Vulnerability Assessment Models for port security and for ship security. And it, it, it was full of unbelievable things like we went, we do screening on ships. So we want to know exactly who's on a ship at any point in time when they come into port. You know, people will, will leave off the ship who are working there and then come back later. And it, that was one of the big issues with them was, you know, they wanted to be able to have girls up on the ship with them and not have to screen them. And we said, no, that's not possible. And they go, well, every, every man on the ship is going to quit if you don't do that, you know? So we held the line. We didn't do that. So we've done everything from ship screening to who gets on a ship or not, especially cruise ships, to looking at uh, medication errors in pediatric patients. They used to prescribe medicine for children, but they really didn't have the analytics to say how much of a regular medicine was an appropriate dose for a two-year-old, for a five-year-old, for a 10-year-old. So we came up with a way to prevent those medication errors, even an automatic way, so that you don't have to depend on the nurse uh, to, to make it exactly right. If she had a bad night or whatever, it doesn't matter. The machine dispenses the, the medicine. So that was a good thing too. And we've done dams, had a lot of jokes about those dam programs and all the dams in the United States. How many? 177,000 natural and man-made dams in the United States. So uh, we had a very exciting time doing all this. And now we're back again with security getting more intense. So one of the things that just came out on June 7th, uh, seven days ago, the National Terrorism, Terrorism Advisory System put out another terrorism threat for uh, white supremacist uh, targets, saying targets could be public gatherings, faith, churches. I know we have some churches on here, schools. I know we have schools on here, uh, racial and religious minorities, government facilities, personnel, infrastructure, critical infrastructure, the 13 elements, one of them is healthcare and hospitals, media and uh, political opponents. So they're just talking about that. You can read it. And I also have the whole bulletin here. So if you wanna download it, what I would do if I was a security director was I would download this and I would send it out to everybody in my organization because they need to know this information. It's, it's critically important. So. We also have other new information. We have the active shooter incidents in the United States in 2021. And I'm gonna send you a link to this when I send you a copy of this webinar recording. And so just to quickly summarize here, if we look at, two, this is comparing 2020 to 2021. So it's like 12 months, right? In 2020, we had 40 incidents in 19 states. In 2021, we had 61 incidents in 30 states. In 2020, we had 164 casualties, 38 killed. And in 2021, we had 243 casualties with 103 killed. And the law enforcement officers killed very low. Uh, law enforcement officers wounded very low. Uh, the net mass killing definition, how many organizations met that? Five did in 2020 and 12 did in 2021. Incidents where law enforcement actually engaged the shooters, there were eight in 2020, 17 in 2021. Uh, the gender of the shooters in 2020, 42, uh, 35 were male, three females, and four unspecified. And in 2021, we had 61 males and only one female. And then the body armor use uh, was very low by shooters. In suicide, the seven committed suicide, 11 uh, in 2021. Shooters killed by law enforcement, four in 2020, 14 in 2021. The shooters killed by cit local citizens who had guns, two in 2020, four in 2021. 
and the shooters apprehended by law enforcement in 24 and 2020 and uh, 30 in 2021. So these are just a quick look at, at what's happening and you can sort of see the, the thing increasing the, as, as it goes through the year to year. So we know that workplace violence isn't slowing down in healthcare or any place else. It occurs more frequently than it did last year. It does occurs more frequently than it did two years ago. And so we're gonna have to go back to the things that we know how to do to stop this rate so that healthcare workers are safe and protected. And right now, OSHA says it's more dangerous to work on a high rise building than it is to work in a hospital. So uh, physicians agree with that. They've been having in, you know, terrible problems too. We can see it just in June, what's happened already in June, the tragedy in Tulsa, we'll just go over it briefly. It says a guy got, got out of a back operation on May 24th, released from the hospital. And, and within like a week, he went back. He shot the doctor who operated on him, Dr. Preston Phillips, who they said was the nicest person in the world. And uh, he also shot another uh, orthopedic doctor. He went to the gun store that day and bought an assault rifle to do all this, an AR style rifle from a local gun store and took it to the hospital along with this Smith & Wesson semi-automatic handgun he'd bought from a pawn shop. And again, nobody knew he had a gun. Nobody even thought of screening for a gun. This was at a, a Catholic hospital, St. Francis Hospital on the campus. It was a Natalie Medical Building. And he just walked right in and started shooting. So that's what we wanna to try to prevent from happening. This is the outside of emergency response waiting around at the building. And just to say, it was just the first week of June and Tulsa was already the 233rd mass shooting of uh, 2022. And so what could have prevented this? So if we start at the bottom, do you think if they had a faster police response, this wouldn't have happened? And no, I don't, I don't, think, that's, I don't think that would have helped at all. Uh, how about if they had panic alarms? No, I don't think that would have helped at all. How about better policies and procedures? No, I don't think that would have helped at all. And please challenge me if you don't agree. What, having a security officer present? No, didn't make any difference, even though there was not one, I don't think at that time. A live receptionist, they had a live receptionist and he was the, she was the first person that the shooter killed. So how about doing concealed weapons screening to enter the building? Yes, that would have made a difference. And that's something that I see every single day and it makes me matter every single time. So this was uh, Encino Hospital Medical Center. Doctors and two nurses stabbed after this guy who they thought was high on drugs parked his car in the middle of the street. He had his dog with him on a leash like he was going for a walk. He barricaded himself. He just left his car running in the middle of the street, took the dog and locked himself up in the emergency room for four hours while the SWAT team tried to negotiate with him. And uh, he stabbed these two officers. One was bleeding very badly. And uh, he, he was, one was in critical condition and had to have surgery. And the three people who were injured by this stabber, all three were taken to Dignity Health, which is a, a place in Northridge, it's very close. And the attacker wasn't released. He had a, as they said he had a, a very long criminal record and was, uh, had an arrest last year for battery of a police officer. So uh, the doctor looked like she was in pain. There was a lot of blood, it's just a thing. Again, how do you avoid something like this? The only way to avoid it is to screen who's coming in your building. And I'll never forget going to the uh, criminal justice system office in Durham, North Carolina. And that's where all the, all the people who are out on parole or on super, some kind of supervision see their parole officer and the guy said, come out here and look in the hedges. So the hedges in front of that courthouse or the building where they have to go through a metal scanner to get into the building. It's full of knives, like a garden of knives. And he said, you know, anytime we need a letter opener, we just come out here. We have 60, 70, 80 knives just stuck in the ground because everybody takes them out before they go through the metal scanner and then picks them up on the way out. This is yesterday. I don't know if you saw this, but this was a lady who was, uh, what was her name? Glendar uh, Johnson Jackson, 65 years old, arrested and charged with one count of felony, of fatal felonies and one misdemeanor count of unlawfully carrying weapons in a prohibited location. And this is in Conroy, Texas, which is near Houston. 
and she she they went they got a call about her that she was acting out they went and picked her up on a mental health hold she was strapped to a gurney in the hospital and she pulled a gun out and started shooting luckily she didn't hit anybody and the EMS saved the day by disarming her and and just stopping her and grabbing the gun they said it was he was the one who did it and she was being pulled in for a mental health evaluation so my question with this is who who decided it wasn't a good idea to check if she had a gun in her clothes and and they didn't even pat her down they did not they did less than they do when i'm going to the airport right and she had a gun a loaded gun and started firing shots in there luckily didn't hit anybody and it was in the morning it wasn't late at night it wasn't you know midnight it was 11 47 a.m when they found at the crime scene and she had been uh, stopped and they got her gun so that was great but again it's the thing why isn't this done routinely ahead of time? And it's just so, I see so many organizations that are completely resistant to doing this. One of them is the churches. So churches are, don't want anything negative. And I understand that, that's a good thing. But they have uh, the guy who shot up that last church also in the first of week of June at Geneva Presbyterian Church in Orange County, California. That guy, he, uh, first he he took super glue with him and the first thing he did that everybody was in there singing to him he super glued the door shut then he took out a nail gun and nailed the door shut then he put a giant chain and a padlock on the church doors and then he went in and started shooting he was chinese and the congregation of geneva presbyterian church is taiwanese so he felt like they should want to be part of china and so he decided to drive two hours to this church to kill them and I think he probably would have the people that he shot were between 75 and 90 years old and the reason they all didn't die is because a doctor had taken his mother to church that day and he picked up a chair and hit the guy over the head and once he was down the congregation leaped into service and they started to uh they tied him up with extension cords that's all they could find so like pulled the extension cord out of the out of the musical instrument that they had there. They pulled the extension cord off the lamps and they tied him up with extension cords and called the police. Again, it's getting to sort of a deadly conclusion here. This is came out at the Reno conference of the IAHSS, which is International Association of Healthcare Safety and Security. I would recommend that you join it if you haven't already, because they have their own requirements that are a little stiffer than some other people. And it really is a wonderful organization. I went to their conference in Reno this year too. And this just looks at the violent crimes that are going up. So they're going up here, something happened, they slowed down again recession and now here they are going back up again to uh 1.7 per 100 beds in 2000 2020 i'm sorry and assaults even higher at 14.2 per 100 beds in 2022 2020 so again you can see that there's more assaults and there are violent crimes but they're both still going up so again you know people talk about safety and security and those are sort of outdated terms, you know, safety means you have a note that says don't stick your finger in a light socket. And uh, security means having that armed guard there. Those things really don't happen that much. So when I try to talk to management about it, why we need certain things, we want to talk about compliance, because there are new compliance rules and also liability and what the liability is for the organization if something bad happens. And so the start of these for people in healthcare is the CMS final rule on emergency preparedness that came out after Katrina, after a hospital was completely isolated. It was in a lake, basically. And, you know, usually they say, how long before the power comes on? Oh, three hours. It'll be on by six o'clock, eight o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever. In this case, it was never going to be on again. And so what do you do with patients who are hooked up to life, life support equipment 
and how long should a nurse stay with a person on life support equipment if there's no electricity and it's going to be at least three months before there is electricity and so there are guidelines for those things now that came out of, of some of these uh, emergency preparedness requirements and also we have OSHA, of course, uh, Occupational Safety Health Administration, and they have a general duty clause that requires any employer, whether it's a city or a school or a hospital or anywhere, to maintain a safe environment through, free of recognized threats. And the word recognized is really important because it means that you knew that that threat was possible. That's what they want you to know, that it's possible if you're in Southern California and Palm Springs, it's possible to have a wildfire and you can't you can't have defenses against that unless you know it's possible. So we'll see how that comes out. And they just have a new standard now for workplace violence. They had one that came out, OSHA 3148. You can look it up. It's specifically for healthcare and social service workers. And in fact, this new house bill, HR 95, is based on this, guideline, this guidance document. And I'll send you a link to that too, if you'd like. And just uh, a week ago, the Senate bill passed. The same thing, nurses unions and advocates are getting, have introduced this bill. Uh, Tammy Baldwin, the Democrat from Wisconsin, Senator Baldwin, she introduced uh, the Workplace Violence Prevention for Healthcare and Social Service Workers Act. So hopefully that's gonna get a lot of support and she has 26 co-sponsors already. So again, this is about how do you prevent this from happening? Well, you can't just wish it away, right? And you can't just tell people to do better because they won't. So we have to think about what solutions would do it. And then we have to figure out as security professionals how to get money to, to, for these solutions. So the first one is access control. And I, it's always, I always say A is for access control. If you don't have access control on your facility, whether it's a hospital, a school, a church or anything, you got nothing. So we've got to have access control. Now we have to have weapon screening too, concealed weapon screening specifically. And so they, one of the things I'm going to show you is they have new, new programs that are just basically two posts that you can have in the hospital colors or school colors and say, welcome on it. All they have to do is walk through it. They don't have to take out their cell phone. They don't have to take out their keys. They don't have to take off their belt, any of that stuff. And it automatically does the, this, the weapon screening for concealed weapons, which is so critically important. Also have, you might, must have current policies and procedures. So if we go back to that incident that happened yesterday where the lady uh, was brought in in an ambulance and she was strapped down on a gurney, I think the policy for that should have been that the person is patted down for weapons. You have to establish, do they have any weapons before you just let them in wherever they're going? We had another one in the emergency, uh, not emergency room, operating room where the guy was having his eye operated on and they, again, they hadn't checked for any weapons in any, it, they didn't land them. There was no screening at the door, nothing. And sure enough, right in the middle of the operation, a, a giant gun fell out of his, a handgun fell out of his pocket. He was completely anesthetized. He didn't throw it. It's just the way his body moved on the operating table. And it caused the, the gun to fall on the ground and go off. And everybody left. They left him there on the table. They had came back when they realized that the gun, you know, wasn't, wasn't going off and nobody was shooting it. But those kind of things just can't happen. Uh, and and the, as you can see, day by day by day, it's getting worse and worse. So that's why I think the policy has to be that you, you screen for these concealed weapons. It just has to be. Securing the doors and the windows, again, nice to have. You know, everybody says, oh, we should make all the uh, first floor windows out of bullet resistant glass. And yeah, you could do that. But actually I've had, I can't remember any it, situation except for July a couple of years ago in the Annapolis Capitol newsroom in Annapolis, Maryland, where they shot through the glass in, in the reception area to get in and kill everybody in the, in the news desk. And uh, other than that, we really haven't had a lot. We don't have a lot of active shooters. They don't go after windows. You know, they, they actually, I think they have a desire to be in contact with their victim and they want to see how scared they are and things. That's why they don't do the easy thing. Well, gee, if you're going to do that, why don't you go outside and just shoot through the window? They don't do that for some reason. And so I'm also advocating bringing back these annual security risks assessments. <clears throat> if your healthcare organization, they're required, <coughs> excuse me, if you're uh, 
if you're required, if you match, if you have to meet OSHA requirements, you're an employer, it's required that you do what they call a workplace, a worksite assessment, which is the same thing as a risk assessment. And again, a, a, a larger company, a safe a, a, a case management program. So if somebody says, gee, Julie came in with a black eye today, one of the nurses, because she got hit in the face by her husband, she told him she wanted a divorce. That should be referred to a case management officer who's either in HR or in, in, in management, and they can meet with the person, they can help them get a restraining order. They can, what we want them to do is diffuse the violent situation that people have become aware of before it affects the organization. That's what we wanna do. And also, you know, monitoring social media. So again, I, I don't wanna really spend a lot of time talking about the U Uvalde police response or lack thereof, because everybody's already saying that it was the, the worst response they've ever seen. And I happen to live in Parkland and I happen to have been here when the Parkland shooting took place where they killed 17 kids and, and 17 others were wounded. And a lot of the reason that they killed so many there because they bled out just like they did at Uvalde because they didn't, they held the first responders in the parking lot, the police officers and the ambulance people they wouldn't allow him to go in. They thought the shooter was still active, even though he had left 20 minutes ago. So all the kids, same thing in Uvalde, they didn't go in and the kids just bled out on the cement. So again, one of the things they have in common with churches and hospitals is it can't happen here attitude. And I'm sure anybody who watched this on the news, oh, we're such a close knit community. Everybody loves everybody, except the ones who are shooting at us. And again, there are just so many things that were missed, just like in Parkland. After the police were warned, they didn't do anything about it. In Parkland, they even called the FBI and reported the guy and they did nothing about it. And they actually passed a new law at the FBI that if somebody calls in and says there's an active shooter who said that he wants to be an active shooter and he wants to kill people in the school, that you have to do something. You can't just write it up and say, okay, that was a, just like it was a message from you know, your cousin who said she's coming to town next week, you know, that's not the same thing. So you have to report these things. And I think that's gonna end up as a policy and procedure. And if it's not in, in the city or county already, it should be your policy and procedure. So again, you know, didn't get notified, didn't allow first responders in, no accountability. So I'm gonna skip through some of these. You remember the Buffalo school shooting now classified as terrorism and now classified as of yesterday as a hate crime also. So they're gonna have a, a, their problem there, the biggest problem there was that they had notified, this guy had his own Facebook or TikTok page where he told people how he was gonna go and kill these people uh, based on the replacement theory problem that he imagined. And uh, some of these people were retired FBI agents and he told them I'm driving there right now, I'm gonna go in and kill these people and right away, and so they had advance notice and not one of those retired FBI agents called the city. They didn't call the store. They didn't call anybody or tell anybody and they knew he was gonna kill them. So that's gonna be a, a huge lawsuit again. And it's gonna be against the, the, the shooter in this case. And this is the same thing, you'll read it because I'm gonna send you the, uh, send you this, the video. This is the Geneva Presbyterian Church shooting again, no access control super glued and nailed the church door shut, chained them, shot 10 senior citizens. Luckily, none of them died. Uh, the doctor hit the guy with a chair just because they were from Taiwan. And again, OSHA can find up to $250,000 for noncompliance. And that's not even a, a, the worst part of it. What OSHA does, and we, I worked with a company that had this happen to them, they didn't do something. And so OSHA basically put an agent, an OSHA agent in their office so that the, he was there to ask, should I do this? Should I do that? What can I do about this? And you have to pay their salary to be there and basically report everything you do. You have to get everything approved by OSHA if, you get, if you're found in non-compliance with this. Same thing for CMS, they're even worse. They can stop uh, your reimbursements in one day. They can close your close your organization so you can have no new admissions. They can, they can 
close the hospital permanently for not providing a safe environment and you can lose millions of dollars. Most hospitals, 50 to 80% of their revenue depends on being reimbursed by Medicare and Medicaid. So obviously it's a big problem if it's not done. Again, doctors now we're seeing is targets for patients who have opioid addictions and things like that. And again, 95% of the nurses of the Minnesota Nurses Association say that they don't feel safe from violence at work. So it's a problem that we have to deal with. In the past, it was a revenue problem uh, after recession, but now that's not so bad. There's still this, it can't happen here idea. And anybody who's got that, it can't happen here idea sort of puts them, I think karma puts them to the top of the list that it could happen there. But a lot of the places that I go and talk to work with companies, hospitals, schools, they're not aware of the fines that they're facing. They're not aware of wrongful death lawsuits that go up to $83 million. They don't understand that. They, and, and that's what I think is the return on investment part is so important. So uh, these are some of the active shooter controls we look at, but they're actually 64 different controls that we look for when we analyze something that's happened and 42 that in for a church or for a school or for a, a distribution center or anything else. So uh, access control is a big deal. And it's not just identifying the people who are in the building, oh, but even though in healthcare, the Joint Commission wants to know and asks you, are you, do you, can you, do you know every single person in your building every minute? And that's what you should have, no matter what kind of organization you have. If you can't afford a, a sign-in system, an automatic sign-in system like FastPass, which is my favorite one, if you can't do that, you should at least have a log book there that you, you, you save every night and back up frequently so you know who's in your building and where they are all the time. Over 50% of hospitals, and maybe it's even closer to 70, do no screening at all. And I'm sure you read the thing about the Brigham and Women's Hospital where the guy, the ex-doctor who got fired for uh, sexual advances, foreign doctor, he uh, came back to the hospital two years later after his unemployment ran out and uh, took a assault rifle in and a gallon of gasoline, walked right in through the lobby of the hospital with that. And they were like, he wore white coats. So everybody said, oh, hi doc, how are you? And he went up to 17th floor, shot three people, uh, set himself on fire, pulled the gasoline over his head, lit the match and, and killed himself right there in the hospital. Not, not a good day, but again, People just so resistant to doing the screening, which, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just a little water here, which I think should be required. And so what we want to do is show management that there's a high return on investment on this. That means that you save more money than you spend buying it. it so it, the screening, there's a new, this Athena security that I've been helping with some of their, uh, the way that some of their visibility that it, you can you get screened. You don't have to have a security officer. I've been to so many places where they have one security person that they hire who sits there 24 hours a day by shift, of course. But basically, they don't do anything. They just sit there and watch the people go through the scanner. This cuts down on that because it has a, a panel that collects the information and takes videos of everything. So not only does it screen for any kind of uh, gun-related metal, but it doesn't, it doesn't alarm for keys, for uh, watch, uh, for a belt buckle, or anything like that. It automatically analyzes and knows the kind of metals, and it's the only one that actually screens for other kinds of metals that are not iron-related, like aluminum and uh, printed guns and all these other things. And it also doesn't require the officer to be there because it's going to automatically notify this whole list of people, whoever you provide in one second, if they find any kind of a weapon, if the system does. So what the part of the risk assessment that's required almost everywhere is based on the idea of return on investment. And I was, I, I flew out to Washington DC for the first time from LA in 1990, 1990 to start working with the defense department to come up with a, a security risk assessment methodology that they could use on their high value assets. And so this methodology is customized for 
critical assets. And so we think about what critical assets do they have at a school? They have the teachers, they have the students, they have the physical facility. What do they have at a hospital? They have patients, they have staff, they have equipment, they have uh, medicine, they have drugs. All these things are high value critical assets. Same thing the Defense Department looks at. What's a high value critical asset? It's people, it's equipment, it's the infrastructure that supports it, the water, electricity, things like that. Those are the critical assets. And so when you analyze them, you want to look at what, what, what would we do if we had no power for three months? Obviously, we wouldn't be doing much of anything, couldn't get people into the building, couldn't lock up electronically, all these different things. So we have to look at the value and make sure that none of these things happens and that we put protections in place for high value that will pr actually protect them and cost less than the value of the asset itself. So it's currently required everywhere in the Defense Department, everywhere in almost every single cabinet level agency, every county, every city, every water district, every electric, uh, electric company in cities, city electric company, state, everywhere. All levels of government, all hospitals, all most schools, Again, on this, how do you look at a high value critical asset and how do you decide how much to protect? So we do that with this uh, return on investment idea. Critical elements to define what the return on investment is for spending money on something. And again, this requires more than you'd think, more than math. We had one at a hospital where they put in a whole new access control system and the physicians wouldn't use it. So it was a million dollars completely wasted because they didn't socialize it first. They didn't train people on how to use it. Doctors wouldn't use it, so nobody used it. And they just had to finally take it out and go back to where they were. That was a long time ago, 15 years. So the things that we look at first are how much does it cost to put this control in place? So for a system like the screening system we're talking about, it's very affordable. You know, It's less than $1,000 in some places for uh, to get this control in place every month every year and go on, what's the maintenance cost of the control over its life cycle? So there's always a maintenance cost that comes in with either assessing the value of that or looking at what could go wrong with it. Or if it's something like uh, having a police officer or a security officer sit near a scanner, what's the cost of having that for 24 hours a day for 365 days a year over its life cycle? then the value of the asset that's protected. So that's the other thing we look at. So how much does it cost to protect? How much are our employees worth? What's the value of a human life or an employee life? And so to look at that, we see, okay, the training the first year over the life cycle of how long that employee is gonna work there is a value of that asset and a person. That's one thing. Now we know how much this is worth, how much we know Mary is worth. What's the likelihood of a threat occurring that would damage Mary or hurt Mary or cause Mary to not be able to do her job? And so we're, we'll go through the threats in a minute, but it's everything. It's the human threats, active shooter, workplace violence. It's all the weather related threats, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, flooding. You, I'm sure you saw this morning, some of the flooding that's going on in, up in uh, Wyoming at the Yellowstone National Park, where somebody's house fell right into the river. The river cut out a whole portion of the park, and they had to vacate, evacuate the whole park and everybody who's inside of it. And it'll be closed for probably a month, probably more like the whole summer. It was, it was so damaging. So, the, so taking the cost of what would happen if that threat occurred, say flooding threat, like in New Orleans, cost everything because the hospital couldn't function without electricity. So, there's a, so that means we need to protect the electricity. So that's why we take these and break them down. Here's the asset we're protecting. Here's how much it costs to operate every year. Here, here's how much it costs to protect it. And then we look at the likelihood of the threat occurring. And we want to make sure that the, the cost of the control that we put in place to protect it isn't, doesn't cost more than the asset value. And that's how we get to calculating the return on investment. So we're gonna go through return on investment calculation. And this is how you explain it to the board. This is how you explain it to management and in the federal guidelines and state guidelines and county too. 
they're pushing it down to the board. They want the board, if the board has, uh, if, if Mary Smith is on the board and she probably has a lot of perks of being on the board, you know, I'm on the hospital board, I'm on the school board, you know, that's great, but there's a responsibility that comes with it. And the responsibility is you're the one who's responsible for making sure that the resources are designated and available for the school, hospital, distribution center, whatever, it's facility to get the best bang for the buck. And this means oh. how much for every dollar you spend, how much would you save by protecting against a different threat? Because we know how much it costs after a hurricane. We, after Harvey, for example, Hurricane Harvey, we it cost billions of dollars of loss. So what could we have done that would have reduced that loss? That's what we want to look at. And what are the controls that would have reduced it? And we also want to make sure that we don't just put in any control. It's got to be something that directly reduces the potential loss if this threat occurs and or if the if the asset was damaged or destroyed so we can do this return on investment calculation i thought it would be fun to put it on a concealed weapon detection system which i feel like if you you don't need any if you don't have a concealed weapon detection system you don't have anything because it'll all these horrible things will continue to happen if people can just hide a, a gun and walk into your facility so what asset are we trying to protect? Personnel could be in a hospital, could be in a school. Again, human life is difficult to value. So we compare it to an asset like a physical facility and to establish a value, we look at the, how much it costs to replace it. So if it's a physical facility like uh, an ambulatory surgery center or a, something like that, what would it, or a medical building like in uh, St. Francis, in Tulsa, what do, what do we look at? We look at how much the building would cost to replace present day replacement value, not what it cost in 1918 to build it, what it would cost today if you build it, that's the value for it. And so we look at the, the value of that, the value of the salary of a person, the cost for replacing that employee at the current employment rates. And then we take a look at all the applicable threats. So that's why you have to have an assessment because that's required for CMS, it's required for OSHA. You have to be, you as management and talking to your board understand they're responsible to make sure that these threats don't happen to, and that in, these are just threats that impact personnel. Workplace violence, uh, which we've seen horrible instances of injury or death due to, could be the bumblebee tuna a couple of years ago, had a guy cleaning the sterilizer and nobody knew he was back there in the back of this long thing cleaning. And so they put in the 82,000 cans of tuna to sterilize and turned the sterilizer up the high and he was dead when they opened it up, his body came out. So there's also a disability. If you cause an employee to get a disability because of work, you're gonna be paying for it forever. Assault, same thing, rape, sexual assault. If there are penalties for those that just awarded some nurses $8 million after a convict who had been brought to the hospital after eating his sandal because he knew, knew that it was easier to escape from a hospital in a maximum security prison. So he ate a plastic sandal and it was in so much distress. They took him in and he took four nurses. He raped one of them. He drug him around by the hair and everything. And of course he was shot by police eventually. And then they, they got an $8 million lawsuit out of it. So every one of these threats has a, a likelihood of occurrence, how often it happens on average. And that's what I say to people who go, it can't happen here, but if it's already happened, it, that, was a, that was a school in Texas, but there've been five other really bad shootings where kids were killed in Texas. So that means that the likely occurrence is higher than it would be maybe in Maine or someplace else like that. And we can find that out by looking at the FBI Uniform Crime Index for every zip code that tells us how this compares to the rest of the United States. So I caused a, a big, uh, big problem in one place that I went when I, unfortunately, they told uh, some of the employees that they were in the bottom 5% of the whole country. That means 95% of cities in the United States were safer than this city. And uh, people were just stunned. They couldn't believe it. They thought that they had this beautiful little town and it was completely safe. They were completely unaware of the crime rate. So these are, are numbers that we get for all these crimes, plus a lot more. I think there are five other ones that we check for every single time. 
for their zip code. We use the FBI active shooter data. We use the Secret Service mass casualty data. We use the FBI Uniform Crime Index that looks at crime as a whole. We also look at the industry data for that. So that's one of the things that IAHSS does is they publish a, a survey every year that says how often this happens as you saw per 100 bids. So if it's happening everywhere else in the country, if it's happened to 100 hospitals already, likely it's gonna eventually happen to you. So then we average these different threat uh, metrics in place. And that's how we put them in place. That's how much, that's how likely it is to occur. And those are very accurate numbers that we look at. So we, once we know how likely is it to occur, then we know, okay, what kind of costs is it gonna cost to fix this? And how much savings are gonna we, we get out of it? And that's the return on investment called bang for the buck. And so we look at controls, especially because threat and risk always in competition with the budget. People call me all the time and say, how can I, I know we need this, they know we need it. How do we, how do we explain it so that people will be able to actually get it funded and do it? And so that's what we look like. So the, one of the things that we take into account are how much is the value of the controls. And controls, some the defense department calls them safeguards, auditors call them controls, but they're either actions or devices or systems that will eliminate, reduce, or mitigate. Re that means cut it down to a manageable level, risks and vulnerabilities. And to assist in making these decisions, that's what the security risk assessment comes in because it comes and says, this is how much, this is your problem. This is how likely this is to happen. This is a control and this is how much it's gonna cost you over time to fix. So if we look at like a concealed weapons detection system and analyze it in the same way, we can go and look at the potential cost if the threat materializes. We can test to see how what other people have used we can look at the other controls that we could include, physical uh, fencing, having camera surveillance. So one place I went, they had uh, they used to have 30 cameras. Now they have 15 because they didn't want to replace the wiring for the new cameras and the old cameras wouldn't work with the, with the old wiring. So again, it was very inexpensive to replace uh, 15 cameras in critical locations, but it could be barricades. It could be improving personnel safety, you know, having a program that walks people to their cars and things like that. And that's how, how we look at that. So then again, you're gonna do a security safety risk assessment every year on each facility separate. It's required for CMS, a worksite, re which is the same thing, assessment required for OSHA. And again, it has to incorporate all this threat data and they say it cannot be a checklist or a spreadsheet. So we, we analyze and update all this threat data. We identify and put a dollar value on the asset. So we have uh, three shifts of nurses. We can put a dollar value on the cost of each of those shifts. The asset value of the technicians, the nurses, the whole hospital staff that's there. In a school, we can do, it can be the cost of the teachers, janitorial service, maintenance, all those things go into it. And then you have an actual dollar value of what security protects, how much your security program protects that asset. Then just to make sure we get it right, we survey the staff. So I have electronic questionnaires I can send out to survey people. I, I do a lot of phone interviews and I found that people are more honest in phone interviews than they are when I'm sitting down eyeballing them in the conference room because there's it's sort of like they're talking to a robot or something, you know, that they're talking but they're not, it's not their person that's sitting in front of me to judge, I guess. And so we ask people, one of the questions I like to ask them is, do you have a workplace violence program, prevention program? And everybody goes, oh yeah, of course we do. I said, well, could you tell me two elements of it? No, they can't because they, they don't know that I already know they don't even have a workplace violence program. It hasn't been formally introduced. They've been working on one in HR, but they haven't sent it out to everybody and said, read this. And then I also make them, people read it, but they have to actually print it out and sign it and return it to HR. So you have their signature that they were aware of this policy, that they were aware of this program. And then we find out, and a lot of times people will just say they have it because they love where they work and they wanna, you know, they wanna make the organization look better by saying they have it. So we double check, make sure that they actually have it in place and working. 
And then we look at the value of all these different controls. And then by combining them, that's where we get the information. So I'm just going to show you. Uh, and again, security is not a legal argument. So these are some security judgments against McDonald's had to pay $27 million. US Security Associates paid $64 million for Kraft Cracker Factory lawsuit, where the lady went out, got fired, went out to her car, got her gun, and came back and shot the people who fired her. And the security people didn't help because they locked themselves in a cast iron boiler room and didn't call police or didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, Stanford Health recently settled $82 million lawsuit after a woman ran over a director in her car after she stepped on the gas instead of the brake, went right through the cardiac rehab facility. And this is a 7.8, almost $8 million for the, the ones who were traumatized and raped by the patient who ate a sandal. And this is just the details about that. If you haven't subscribed to my risk alerts, uh, please do, because I put them out almost every day, two at least twice a week. And they cover what the thing was, what happened, how it turned out and what the lessons learned, okay? So I also wanna include and make sure that the board and management understands that if you have a high, a high value loss like they did in Parkland and Uvalde and some of these other places, Buffalo, these incidents create millions of dollars in liability if it occurs, wrongful death lawsuits. And you have 15 people a wrongful death, you know, and it's just like $10 million a piece, it's a tremendous amount of money. And a lot of companies go out of business instantly, hospitals too. So again, you have to have that assessment and it actually, just the physical fact of having it, it helps you. And so here's our return on investment for concealed weapon detection systems. Cost to replace a staff member, $10 million. Potential wrongful death lawsuit is $3 million per person. And how much is the cost? So this is how much we could lose if we had one incident, one person got killed, it would cost the organization, in this case, $3 million. What's the cost of having a concealed weapon detection system? $1,500. So $1,500 times $12, $18,000. So now we can do a return on investment on that and say for every dollar they save, this is how much they're going to get back. So these are the things we look at and, commun and aggregate and include in this formulas are the threats, real numbers about how often the threats occur in similar organizations in your region, in your area. Obviously they're different in Montana than they are in Tennessee. We look at the uh, asset criticalities. How, how long could you do without something? Is it life-threatening? Survey the staff to validate what they're saying evaluate the controls. And again, we have a dollar value attached. We know how much the controls cost. And then we create our action plan. And what we're doing here is creating a cycle of continual improvement because every year we start and then we go through it and then we know what we have to do for the next year. We start over again. What are the threats this year? It's hotter. Maybe we have a heat index problem. You know, Maybe we have a flooding problem. Maybe we have a gun violence problem, whatever it is. And then again, we look at the assets and see how critical they are. Let's go through this whole thing every year. And the good thing is that they don't require you to fix everything at one time. So say that the assessment decided that the best thing we could do is have panic alarms and they're $15 for each panic alarm. You don't have to go out and buy 30 panic alarms for the whole facility, plus all the floors and everything and all the departments. Instead, you can say, okay, this is our plan. We're going to buy five panic alarms this year. Next quarter, we're going to buy two more. The next quarter, we're going to buy two more. The next quarter, we're going to buy two more. So you end up with your 12 panic alarms by the end of the year, but you don't have to do it all at one time. Again, that what we want to do is have start to manage the, this risk assessment and the improvement and the controls based on what the threats are telling us. So again, these are some of the things that we look at, including the AC, your vehicles, the physical facility, the IT equipment, the infrastructure, uh, supplies and equipment, especially biomedical equipment, things like that, salaries. And then we include all this industry data that we get from Department of Homeland Security, OSHA, FEMA, uh, National Facilities Protection, uh, NFPA, city and county governments data. We get a lot of regional data from counties about uh, weather threats and things like that. And then of course the FBI Uniform Crime Index data our regional data, all hazards data, and our active shooter mass casualty data. 
And so then what we do is average it together. So if we look at assault, we say, okay, uh, we've had five assaults in the last year. The industry data says that we have, uh, they have five assaults at IAHSS and the Uniform Crime Index gives us a score of 12. So we add these together and get 22 divided by three. It's about, about uh, it's about, it's the average is seven times a year. And that, so we don't look at each single one. We aggregate them together to get averages for how often we have assault seven times a year. So that's how much we know we can spend on a control to make sure that that doesn't happen. Same thing for workplace violence, illegal weapons, drug incidents, robbery, theft, all these different things. And so the concealed weapons detection system, I've been helping Athena Security explain to people what that is. And I think it's a, with all the gun things going on now, I think it's a fantastic solution because I can tell you they are not checking at the entrance. So all the guns, in fact, the Cleveland Clinic said, the CEO said that the first year they at, it started collecting things by using a screening program like this. They had 40,000 weapons. They had knives, guns going into their facility every day and they had no idea. It looked at all the, their facilities in Northern Ohio. And again, it can also uh, take the employee badge and integrate with RFID technology. You don't have to, you don't have to use it turnstile. You don't have to push anything out of the way. It maintains the highest possible traffic flow, like 3,000 people can walk through there. It can open and lock doors in the facility if you want, or turnstiles, things like that. So you can actually, if you want to use a turnstile, you can. It can lock somebody in there, like we call it a man trap. And again, it can send you an alert if you're the security director or if you're the compliance officer or if you're the, uh, the op CLO or the CFO, you can see, you can get the alert anywhere that they found something and you can decide whether you want to go there, you want to call somebody else, whatever. And you can have unlimited amount of people who get these alerts. It can include the police department, the fire department. It can include the uh, emergency response. And again, People want a safe and secure world, and they don't want to feel like they enter a jail. And that's why they've used AI concepts to create this new walkthrough metal detectors. They also can screen for temperature, and they did. That's where they sort of got started was during COVID, where they could continually screen people. Now, I was at a hospital in Los Angeles last month, and I had to go to the desk every single day and have them take my temperature with a temperature strip and write it down all this, this does that automatically because there was a big line there of people, three people trying to you know, take temperatures. This does it automatically if we just walk through. And so it makes it really easy. You don't have to take out your, as I said, keys, belt, watch, whatever. And you also don't have to have somebody sitting there all the time. And that's why it's very cost effective because you don't have to add in those costs. And so here's what it looks like. Here's a guy going through with his backpack. He just walked through these two columns I like to dress them up in colors and say welcome on the columns in the hospital colors or the school colors, whatever it is. You can go right in through your backpack and it knows the difference between a weapon and anything else by the metal content. And it detects more concealed weapons than any other screening system. And I found out through the federal government, it's the only one that's federally certified and it's very inexpensive, I think, for what it does. So again, this is how we look at the controls. We look how much they're implemented and you know how much they'd save you and everything. There's only uh, one other thing that I wanted to go through this really quickly is you need to talk to management about what you need to secure your facility. If you wanna try doing an ROI on it, call me, I'll be happy to help you do it. Lack of security is not an effective legal argument. And again, you can do these assessments as the basis for your calculations to return on investment to get the best bang for the buck. So you can write me for more detailed information. Uh, Michael Green is the CEO of Athena Security Entryway Product. If you're interested in that, you can write to him. But before we go away, I would like to get out of here. And I want to show you, since I'm busy screen saving here, I want to show you what a report looks like. So here's a report on the Orion Medical Center and it talks about the background, where it's done, what it looks like, you know, what, the, what we're looking at, the vulnerability profile, the natural threats identified, the human threats, 
like domestic terrorism, environmental threats, power failure, water pollution, all these things. And then we look at all the data sources that we got for them. And so this is how we look for Deerfield, New York, that their crime index is a five. And that means 95%, it's safer than 95% of US cities. It's any US city is safer than there. They're only, they're only 5%. 95% of the cities in the United States are safer than them. And then it breaks down their crime. It shows it how it compares to the state level of crime. And it looks at property crime, you know, motor vehicle crime, the stealing of, of all sorts of things. It's, it's three, four times worse than the rest of the state of New York. And here's the crimes that are the most problem, violent crime, the worst is larceny and theft, burglary, property crime, murder, violent crime. And these, again, are based on uh, values for uh, FBI identifies these. And you can go ahead and look at all these. And then we look at natural disasters. So what are the natural disasters? Not much chance of earthquakes, no chance at all of hurricanes, uh, medium chance of hail, not, not, not a major tornado problem. So again, this is a place that's relatively low in natural disasters. Then we can look at the, we have, reg, we have all the data about the environmental hazards, registered data is where they have tanks that may be leaking out, things like that. And then look at recommendations for security and investment, what you need to do, you need to have signage, need to have uh, posts so people can't drive into the crash into the front of the hospital. It happens all the time. They sit out in their truck and they honk three times. If you don't come, they drive through the front of the building. Because of the high crime rate there, we recommend posting no weapons decals on the outside of all the exterior doors, update the emergency plans based on the risk assessment, and here's how we look at these controls. So we say, does it have an area of refuge? No, it doesn't. We need to designate a safe area. It's a requirement of CMS. Do we have uh, posts at the front entry so people can't drive in? No, we don't. Do we have bomb threat procedures? Yes. So here are all the things that plans. We're really good at, at having all the plans in place, but we need to analyze them by their return on investment. And here, what's the weakness? The one thing that would be the most protection access control, they only have 20%, but they have all this other stuff, but not the, the most important one. Again, incident reporting program, another one that's uh, usually not, not available very much. Monitoring of the cameras, they don't have a place to do that. And a lot of places I go, they have cameras doing monitoring and they're locked up in an IT closet somewhere. So the receptionist can't see them. So if you hear an explosion in the parking lot, you can't just look up and see what it is. You have to get the IT guy to give you the key to open the closet, to look at cameras, uh, motion detectors, uh, panic and duress alarms. No, you know, at $15 a piece and they only have 10% of them. They should be at every single nurse's station. Of course they should be at the emergency room, uh, parking lot, garage controls, they've got none. And it, so it just goes in through everything, the alternate feed, extra power, generators, security escorts after dark, uh, warning signs and no weapons were in progress. And then we look at all the threats. So we look at the active shooter, arson, assault, bomb threats, burglary, chemical spills, and we have an occurrence number, how often occurs there. So 0.5 means every other year, uh, 0.2 means every five years, or in this case, like 15 years, fire, all kinds of fires, natural disasters, homicide, murder, storms, hurricanes. It could be ice storms too. It doesn't have to be a tropical storm. It could be we've had ice storms, severe cold, vandalism, workplace violence, of course. Once every five years is the average for healthcare. And then we have all the data about what all these things mean and how they all go together. And that's where we get our return on investment. So those are just some things to think about that are going to help you. And again, if you need any help, if you're interested in contacting Michael to talk about the Athena system for, inter, for screening for concealed weapons, it really makes a lot of sense. If you want to call me, you can call me anytime. You can email me there. If you want to write down my phone number, it's 301-346-9055. And again, I've been in Parkland, so I've been through it all. And I want to thank everybody. I know there's some confusion about the links. Sometimes I get carried away and I may have gotten the wrong link, but I'm glad you all made it. And I will be sending you all a letter today and an email 
and it'll have the the recording of the webinar Again, thank on you it. all it'll for coming i really FBI appreciate it on it and it'll and, have uh, anything else that you want i hope i'll talk to you about. again soon so just ask me and i'll be uh, happy stay to in touch think you. about return and i hope you have a great and rest I think of the week it's a, i use Wednesday, it in my right? every, every okay. kind of thing in my whole life almost so it's a it's a big deal for me to to talk about return on investment and how much it's going to help everybody especially to stop this i can't take having a a, a shooter incident every single week is too much for me so you're going to have to save me by uh, getting some of these scanning systems in and other controls. So again, have a great week. It was great to talk to you and sometimes.